Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the Railroad Hour. And here comes our summer show train. Tonight, the Association of American Railroads inaugurates another season of new musical plays and operettas, created especially for the Railroad Hour, and starring Gordon McRae and his charming guest, Dorothy Warren Show. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Yes, tonight and every Monday night, the world premiere of a new play with music is brought to you by the American Railroads. The same railroads that bring you most of the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the fuel you burn, and all the other things you use in your daily life. And now, here is our star, Gordon McRae. Thank you, Marvin Miller, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to another summer of brand new musicals by our Railroad Hour playwrights, Lawrence and Lee. Tonight, our story is called The Minstrel Boy. Dorothy Warrenshold is Bessie. I have the very Irish name of Tom Moore, and J.M. Carrigan is our narrator. Ladies and gentlemen, may we introduce The Minstrel Boy. <laughs> Top of the evening to you. Well, I'm an Irishman, but that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Now, you know, some countries have something they call a poet laureate. Well, we never got round to that in Ireland, but we did have a bard, a singer of songs, so familiar to all of us that we never called him Thomas, but just simply Tom. Tom Moore, as if we'd known him all the days of our lives. And so we have. Give me for those endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly today. Were to change by tomorrow and flee. You know that song, and half a hundred others that Tom Moore wrote. They sound remarkably like the heartbeats of Aaron. Let's look in on his life. The time he came to London from Dublin town, with a sheaf of music paper under his arm. I'm sure you'll want to publish this one, sir. Well, go ahead, Mr. Moore. The minstrel boy to the war is gone in the of death you'll find him his father's sword he hath girded on and his wild harp slung behind him land of song said the warrior bard though the world be It's a melancholy song, Mr. Moore. It has no fire. Well, sir, g- give me a drumbeat and 20,000 marching men, and you'd hear the fire in this song. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Moore, what is this harp you're always harping on in all your songs? Well, sir, it's a symbol. A symbol of all the fierce pride, all the sadness and laughter of my countrymen. The ancient minstrels carried such a harp and, and played these melodies. You mean these tunes aren't even original with you, Mr. Moore? Well, I've merely performed a wedding ceremony. I've taken some ancient melodies and married words to them. And in a few cases, I have high hopes that they will live happily ever after. Well, not in my publishing house. Good day, Mr. Moore. It's an old story. The young poet going from door to door. Well, that didn't happen to Tom Moore. For the second publisher he went to recognized a good thing when he saw it. And before you knew it, Tom Moore was a famous man. Everybody in Ireland and England was singing his songs. But you know, he never really heard one of them sung back to his own heart till one night in a music hall. There was a girl on the stage. A girl named Bessie. If you were Tom Moore and you'd hear that beautiful girl sing your song, would you go backstage? Well, that's exactly what he did. I enjoyed your singing, Miss Elizabeth. Oh, they must knows me well, calls me Bessie. Bessie. Well, Bessie, where did you learn to sing like that? Well, now, they told me as how you was in the audience. And I was that nervous I could scarcely open my mouth. Oh, you've got a voice like an angel. Oh, Mr. Moore, do you say pretty things to every girl you meet? All the time. All the time. The time I've lost in wooing and watching and pursuing the light that lies in woman's eyes has been my heart's undoing. Though wisdom oft has sought me, I scorn the Lord she brought me. My only books were woman's looks. These follies going, and is your fraud growing too cold or wise for a brilliant eyes? Oh, gain who's a headed glowing. No vain, alas, and ever from bond so sweet to sever for wisdom's chance against a glance is now as weak as ever. <laughs> <laughs> Will you go out with me, Bessie, uh, for a bite of supper and some bright music? Oh, uh, I don't know, Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore? Now, who's that? My name is Tom. Ah, then I'd love to go out with you, Tom. Good. Robin, I am in love. Ah, uh, sure, of course you're in love, Tom. It's part of a poet's job. No, no, no. I'm in love with Bessie. What? Not Bessie? Why not? 
What's wrong with Bessie? But she's not educated. She's, she's not intelligent. Ah, she doesn't need to be, Rob. She has intelligence of the heart. Oh, now, Tom, you're a famous man. So you could have any girl you wanted. Somebody from society, perhaps. Oh, no, Rob. Have you seen the look in her eyes? Or have you listened to her smile? <sighs> Such charms, Rob. Oh, charms fade, Tom. Do they now? I don't think it would make any difference, Rob. Not a bit. Everybody you know will be against it. But I'll be for it, Rob. And that's what matters. <laughs> Bessie, I want you to marry me. Oh, you didn't say it. You couldn't have said it. Don't you love me, Bessie? Oh, I love you so much, Tom. But I've been crying my pillow wet as a dish rag every night since I've met you. No, because I don't think I'm good enough for you. You are. I ain't. Aren't. That's what I said. Bessie, you're the loveliest girl I've ever known. I know that. Huh? Uh, Well, I mean, uh, well, well, now I can look into the mirror and I can see that I have a pretty enough face. But ten years from now, or twenty, oh, Tom, would you still love me then? It is not while beauty and youth are my own, and my cheeks unprofaned by a tear, that the fervor and faith See, no matter what happens, no matter what anybody says, no matter what tomorrow changes or the day after tomorrow might bring, though it still be adored as this moment night, let thy loveliness fade as it will. in a moment for Act Two of The Minstrel Boy. Did you know that this year railroads will spend more than $1 billion to improve and expand their facilities to provide better railroads to help you live better? $1 billion to help me live better? Well, in what way? Well, virtually everything you eat and wear, buy, or use is moved by railroad on its way to you. And the $6 billion the railroads have spent on improvements in the past six years are helping you get what you want, when and where you want it. Well, what has that $6 billion bought? It's bought more than 400,000 new and bigger freight cars and more than 14,000 new, more efficient locomotives. Tracks, signals, yards, and repair shops have been improved and made more efficient. Thousands of additional freight cars and locomotive units are now on order. You railroad people certainly fill a mighty big shopping bag. But what does all that new equipment add up to in terms of direct benefits to me? To begin with, it has meant that even with the heavy additional transportation demands of defense, your needs have still been taken care of. The house you live in, the car in your garage, your youngster's clothes. You could not enjoy the use of any of those things were it not for the thousands of miles of rail transportation that went into their production and distribution. What's more, the railroad's billion-dollar-a-year improvement program has enabled them to serve you with a low-cost efficiency that would not otherwise have been possible. And without the additional equipment and improvements these billions of dollars have bought, the railroads could not have kept pace with our growing transportation needs and at the same time give top priority to our national defense transportation demands. That's how you and all of us have benefited and will continue to benefit from the railroad's billion-dollar-a-year program for better railroads to give America better service. 
Now, here is act two of the new Lawrence and Lee play with music, The Minstrel Boy, starring Gordon McRae as Tom Moore and Dorothy Warren Schold as Bessie, with J.M. Kerrigan as our narrator. The Now, isn't it strange that the coin everybody thinks is a rusty farthing often turns out to be solid gold through and through? And you know, that's the way it was with Bessie. Everybody said their marriage couldn't work. Ah, but Tom and Bessie fooled the whole British Isles by spending a mere 40 years together in almost perfect domestic felicity. But there was one thing that worried Tom Moore. Oh, Bessie, what's happened? There's no spirit left in Ireland. They sing no more songs. The harp is silent. Mm, perhaps we've become a little hard of hearing, Tom. You can't keep hearing and singing of love's young dreams when you're 50. But I walk through the streets of Dublin town, Bessie, and I see no more singing faces. What's happened to our countrymen? Bessie, I've got to do something. Something to give Ireland a voice. What, Tom? I'm going to write a comprehensive history of Ireland. Oh, you've already written it, Tom. In your song. Oh, those little verses everybody's forgotten. I have to do something important, worthwhile. Four volumes, perhaps five, or maybe even six, to tell the whole story of this country. Yes, it, it should take six thick volumes. And such a lot of thick words. Listen, listen to this, Bessie. The basic philosophic tenets of the early Gaelic cultural achievements were destined to set a pattern of emotional involvement. Uh, Bessie, you're not listening. Oh, I am. I am, Tom, but, but I don't understand the words. And what words don't you understand? Let's start at the beginning. The? You understand the word the, don't yes, you? Yes, Tom, yes. No, in, in that sentence, I don't think I even understand the word the. You don't think my history is any good. I didn't say that. It's just that I wonder if you aren't trying too hard to be grand. You were such a great man, Tom Moore, when you wrote things everybody could sing and understand. Go to bed, Bessie. Go to bed. You don't know what you're talking about. Yes, Tom. Bessie. Yes, Tom? When I keep scribbling long into the night, what do you think about up there alone in the dark? Oh, 
lots of things, Tom. I lie there in the darkness and listen to my heart. Tom Moore wrote five volumes, and it was nearly the death of them. The publishers advertised it, a major history of Ireland by the most famous Irish writer of our century. Then Tom waited for the acclaim that would make him immortal. Bessie, the reviews from London, they've just arrived by the morning post. Oh, what did they say? Tom Moore, who used to be a fine and eloquent singer of songs, has become a pompous literary hack. He's turned out a dull and uninspired history of Ireland. Bessie. Oh, that's only one of them, Tom. Read another. Uh, Tom Moore has taken the hot potato of Irish history and has given us a cold mess of Irish stew. Oh, Bessie, suddenly I'm tired, so very tired. Tom. Everything, my whole life seems so unimportant. But you don't have to do important things to be important. Oh, it's much better to be the best baker's helper in the world than to be a bad prime minister. Oh, now, please, Bessie. Don't try to be profound. Well, now, take that Sir Walter Raleigh. Now, he wrote all those fine, grand books. And he took all of those voyages. And what do we remember him for? Throwing his coat in the gutter. <laughs> oh, Bessie. What could I do without you? I should count my blessings. One, my wife. Uh, what, what in the devil is that, Bessie? Well, open the window and see. Come on. Come on. There he is. There he is. Well, what's, this, what's this all about? By popular demand, the Dublin printing shop has put out a new edition of Irish Airs by Tom Moore. Half the population of Dublin have copies in their hands, and they're singing the songs in the top of their lungs. Betsy, did you hear that? Hey, hey, we've got a fine carriage here. We've discharged the horse, and we'd like to pull you and your beautiful wife through the streets of Dublin. How about it? Would you do me the honor, Bessie Moore? Oh, it would be one of the grand pleasures of midlife. <laughs> They still talk about that day in Dublin when the citizenry sang their hearts out as they pulled Bessie and Tom through the streets. Let every remember the days of old, ever save the sons we trailed her. When Malachi wore the car of gold, which he wore from the proud invader, when her kids were standing up. Why are you crying, Bessie? Oh, I'm laughing. 
laughing and crying, laughing mostly. crowding into my head. I love thee still. And 40 years more. How about then, Tom? Thou would still be adored as this moment. But let thy loveliness fade as it will. Dorothy Warren Scholl will be back in just a moment. And our deepest thanks to J.M. Carrigan, who was our narrator, to Dan O'Hurley, O'Hurley he, and to our entire company. Excuse me, Dan. The Mr. Boy, based on the life and songs of Tom Moore, was a new musical play written especially for the Railroad Hour by Lawrence and Lee. The Railroad Hour is brought to you each week at this same time by the Association of American Railroads. Marvin? A billion dollars a year. Even in these days, that's a lot of money. But that's what the railroads have spent just on improvements since the end of World War II. That adds up to well over $6 billion spent to give America the rail transportation service it needs for commerce and defense. This year, the railroads are prepared to spend well over another billion dollars for still further improvements so that they can continue to give the nation the kind and quantity of railroad transportation it needs and must have. Ladies and gentlemen, next Monday, the world premiere of another new play with music, The Swedish Nightingale. And Dorothy, you'll be playing the role of the fabulous Jenny Lynn. Ah, and who are you going to be, Gordon? Well, I'm going to have a circus next week, Dottie. My card, P.T. Barnum. <laughs> well, I thank I go home now to practice up my Swedish accent. <laughs> <laughs> See you next Monday, Mr. Barnum. <laughs> Good night, Dorothy. How endearing can charms get? Good night, everybody. All aboard! Well, friends, it looks as though we're ready to pull out, and so until next Monday night and another premiere, this is Gordon McRae saying good night, everybody. <laughs> Gordon McRae can be seen starring in Warner Brothers' About Face. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. This is Marvin Miller saying goodbye until next week for the American Railroads. Now stay tuned for your Monday night of music on NBC. Proceeding was transcribed. Stay tuned now for the telephone hour on NBC.